Um, righto, Jake Malby in the studio, uh, a guy that I have been following intensely for the month of August. Uh, you did something that is pretty, uh, pretty remarkable. Run 31 marathons in 31 days to raise awareness for mental health. Not just awareness, you raise a shit ton of money too. Um, but yeah, so I was like captivated by your stories and, and watching what you're doing for that month. And I was like, yep, got to send him a message, got to get him on. This is a, a crazy, crazy undertaking from a guy that obviously is crazy in some way in, in his own right. Yeah, and I'm uh, super pleased to be here, continuing to spread the message. So, yeah, thanks for having me on, man. No, I appreciate it. We pull this up even further. Yeah, like real close. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you should be able to hear the difference in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like way yeah. better. Um, so where did the um, where did the initial thought come from for you to like do this 31 ma- 31 marathons in 31 days? Well, originally, um, running has been my saving grace with my mental health. So. Um, it was actually Christmas day last year I was sort of feeling a bit lonely and uh, both my parents are shift workers so I was at home brainstorming a few ideas of how and what I could do to keep mental health sort of in the air longer than that day so we have are you okay for days like yeah. one day a week so yeah I really wanted to you know put it in the air for that that the month and uh, make a movement so Christmas day last year and then uh, I had the wheels in motion I think it was by a January the 13th living we're on board and training already started so yeah yeah it's crazy um like we do do days like are you okay day and you've got like mental health awareness day and you've you've got days but to do like a a month long thing like that is pretty cool that you kind of thought like yeah let's not just make this a one day one off deal like let's really push to really make this like a you know like a whole month worth of uh, awareness and, and active, um, you know, like see, spreading a message for, for an entire month. Yeah, and um, that was my thing as well. Like I wanted to get lots of cash for the ca- for, for living, but my big thing was spreading the mes- message and uh, creating the awareness. So I wanted it to be as uh, community-based as possible. So I uh, the idea, I had a vision of... Uh, running the 31 marathons and having the community jump in with me when they can and uh, share their stories about mental health and uh, their dealings with mental health and uh, well, over the month I've heard stories like you wouldn't believe and people opening up and uh, you know groups of 10 people where you know they wouldn't even open up in front of their own family so it was like kind of my vision was to get the community out but it was more than what i what i'd envisioned like i had yeah kind of created like a safe like a safe group yeah. for people to be able to open up and you know express their emotions and feelings which i mean living's quote and ain't weak to speak is uh, the whole reason why everything intertwined with my story and my upbringing so yeah it was perfect and so to backtrack a bit before we get too far into the marathon stuff like so you've obviously had some stuff that you've dealt with uh, from a mental health perspective uh, in your life previously? Yeah, so myself personally was uh, started off at a younger age, I guess, dealing with adversity at a younger age in my life. And it started off when I was 16, halfway through year 11 at school and my partner at the time uh, got diagnosed with cancer. And at that time, her, her father died uh, when she was two from cancer as well. So her mom had to go to work and I took it upon myself to go uh, to leave leave school and look after her. And every second day, surfing was my sport back then. Was, that was my what I thought would allow me to be in the present moment. Um, so I used to go over Australia every second day, surf, and I'd find myself out the back when the, when there was no surf, just bawling my eyes out, just you know coming to terms with the seriousness of what I was uh, what I was dealing with, and. Uh, you know, seeing a 16-year-old girl lose her hair and go through all that, it was, uh, wasn't was a good sight for her and her family as well. But I uh, used to go surf, come back, put on the, uh, my big boy pants and, uh, you know, put on that brave face. And one, one thing left, led to another. I, uh, that was a broken down relationship two years after um, when I started um, jumping in with the wrong crowd and, you know, 
uh, having dealings with drugs and addiction and drugs and addiction was my uh i guess my escape at the time to make me feel you know like i guess somewhat of a normal human being mm. what i thought at the time um as what well sort as of, what sort of drugs and stuff got you into that place uh well i was on ice for a good nine months so i had done pretty much any party drug like your yeah, coke i was a uh, ping is like i used to stay up every tuesday thursday friday saturday sunday but still maintain my full-time work in yeah. uh, in the, the the trade i was doing but um yeah it was a it was a tough time but i was also mixing that with my antidepressants so and uh and my anxiety medication which was never going to be a good you yeah. know cocktail of of drugs and before i knew it uh things got a little bit too uh full on and um as well at the time i wasn't talking about my my emotions and my uh my feelings and how i was actually going about life and one thing led to another probably a saving grace the people who i was hanging out with i uh, had a fallen out with one of them which is probably the best thing that could have ever happened to me because uh it allowed me to move back in with my parents and uh you know hang out with them for a little bit and then i actually met another female um at the time and we moved to palm beach which is where i, I still uh, live now and this female was like changed my life she was a good loving caring supporting um person someone that i needed in my life at that point yeah but um unfortunately at the time i was so embarrassed about my mental health and uh i kept taking uh kept like i hid from her taking medication for two and a half years and there were so many things and so i just like the antidepressants and the yeah. anxiety stuff yeah because i didn't want to you know i've just felt like I guess, again you feel weak to speak yeah 100 percent. Right? like i didn't want to show that vulnerability um at the time because the people who i used to hang out with you know showing vulnerability was a, a form of weakness as such so that was something i was never gonna do especially to a partner you know had feelings for didn't want to burden her with anything and uh yeah but she was someone that was always pushing me she knew like she could see that i needed help yeah and she was always pushing me to go speak to someone but me being me i just thought you know i'm off the hard drugs i still smoked a lot of pot like ridiculous amount of pot and uh do you still smoke now no nah, i don't know yeah Are you can just clean like clean completely. i don't mind the beers you know yeah, like yeah, yeah. i don't mind but okay yeah mind yeah. in saying that like for seven months not that i told myself i was going to not not a uh, drink but for the this first seven uh, months of training for project 31 i didn't touch a beer and that was just for my own you know i was i was happy waking up yeah. sort of early in the mornings but yeah it was uh i uh, started you know really having feelings for her and then but i still couldn't go get help i still felt like you know my i was under control with my antidepressants and stuff so that was and can you abuse them in the same way that you can abuse other drugs do you think 100 percent, 100 percent. like i never did because i was actually too scared of like telling people that i was even on them so i was yeah. abusing other drugs instead so like yeah what, what's the um because i i haven't dealt with antidepressants or anything but like what are the effects of if you do go too far with those well my it's like i guess i guess it's you different get a high yeah but yeah but you get a high from well you you feel not yourself which yeah. i guess people chase that yeah. feeling you know the the they want to go to a different world and yeah um with mine i was on prestique and valium so i've always found when i was around myself i was oh uh, uh, yeah I was, I've, so i've had valium yeah i was never myself like yeah. i just felt so hollow and you know like i was almost on autopilot like, like a robot numb. Yeah, yeah numb exactly had no feelings and no emotions which i mean at the time is what i needed because i needed to be to able quiet to, the voices yeah and, exactly yeah. you know get that chemical imbalance in my head sorted so i was able to you know function somewhat as a, a normal human being um was the weed detrimental uh at the time it probably was because the amount You're i was doing smoking so much. yeah so and um so she did everything for me but um 2015 my mother i uh, got a phone call from my little brother and i was actually working i took a bit of transition from work and I was uh, working at JSW Power Sports, which is lucky at this oh, time. Oh, sick. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I was this. I'm, I'm so I know James Berger pretty good. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, um, yeah, so like I've been a comms technician for oh, nine and a half years now. But yeah, with this, tr like with everything going on with my life, I, I thought it was work. So I tried doing something a little bit different. So I went and uh, worked in the pre delivery at uh, JSW, building yeah. jet skis. And. Um, 
Yeah, I got a phone call. It was uh, about lunchtime, uh, about July, mid-July um, 2015 from my little brother. And I couldn't even understand him at the time. It was just couldn't string together sentences. All I remember him saying was mum and home. And I knew straight away, like, something was up. I needed yeah. to go. I needed to go. So I jumped on my motorbike and shot over there within, like, six, seven minutes. And uh, I found my mother unconscious on the ground. Um, she wasn't in a good way at all. I asked my little brother sort of what his actions were, but him being so young, he didn't really, you know, jump on the phone, call up an ambulance or anything. So that was the first thing we did. And then I had to work with my mother till a quick response ambo came. And uh, I found out she tried overdosing on prescription medication and taking her own life. So I always had suicidal, I guess, ideas in my head, thinking to myself, you know, my life would be so much better, you know, if I wasn't here or, you know, other people's lives would be so much better if, if I wasn't here. So, but to actually see the strongest woman in your life, you know, mm. laying on her back. Did you know that she had had, she had issues with that sort of stuff at all? Or? Yeah. So uh, my mother was fairly open with us about her mental health, uh, probably about the year, a year or two before. But she, I've, I'm, I'm open and speak with her all the time now and I, she'd been battling long before yeah that. so um but yeah at the time seeing you know the strongest woman unconscious on the floor kind of leaves you to it makes think it feel real huh yeah and it's like what hope do i have like uh, true yeah you know like i've been battling since i was 16 my poor mother's been battling well i didn't know at the time but who knows 20 years that doesn't leave you with much hope you know to to start thinking and uh after all that, mum uh, ended up getting admitted into a ward for a little bit and now she's actually really healthy, really happy and I'll get get into that a bit later yeah, on. Yeah. But um, it was 2016, so it took a lot, of to a lot of toll on my relationship at that point. I ended up uh, jumping on the pot even more to the point where later on down in the relationship, about it was July um 2016 my partner ended up leaving me after three and a half years which i do not blame her one bit mm. she tried so hard to you know straighten me up and get me the much needed help i i, I needed i'd go speak to you know a psychologist but it'd be like one or two sessions and i feel like it wouldn't work for me but yeah. now i know you keep going till you find the right person yeah but at that point i didn't know these things and uh i was very like sort of self like uh self-sufficient or tried to be anyway wouldn't reach out and uh so once she left i had a um a, well we had a pug together um which that thing saved my life for two weeks i uh stayed in bed didn't call up work um sick or anything i was just ghosted myself um and yeah it was halfway through august 2017 the only thing that kept me going for the two weeks before was feeding my dog um, taking her for the two walks three walks every day and then i'd put myself back in bed wouldn't eat barely even drunk water like i was yeah not well 17th of august 2016 i sat on the end of my couch and i remember it like it was yesterday i uh put the note pen to the paper and i wrote out two suicide notes i wrote out one to my ex-partner at the time because i was battling demons long before she came in my life like yeah. i didn't want any repercussions of you know to like making her think she had anything to do with it exactly and like mate we don't you don't want that to leave anyone with guilt even though like i yeah i was battling since i was 16 but she didn't know that so yeah. um put the pen to the paper and uh wrote out that first note and i was pretty off my face on valium and drinking lots of piss at that time so yeah. uh, there was no emotions or feelings going into that first note and then the second note was to my family and uh i started writing this second note and it started getting down to my my brother's names and uh mind you just before i um i get into it my brother ben malby he's a ultra distance runner been a runner for many years i used to look at him and just go you're crazy you're crazy why yeah. are you even doing these things to yourself like you end up in the back of an ambulance like how can you see enjoyment from that and uh just before all this he uh just had a kid just bought a new house and a year before that he just got married so like for me to pick up the phone was a massive task but i wasn't even going to tell him i just wanted to hear his voice and have a chat to him picked up the phone and i'm so thankful that i that i did at this time because i had everything ready to go i had the chair out i had the belt sitting at the door frame it was um the end of my tether what was it did, what was it like to sit there and like set that shit up 
to be honest, it's it, you hear from people you speak to who have either tried to, but it's almost or have you know like have, have tried to or you know have called it like what I have, yeah. what I did. But it's almost like the calm before the storm. Mm. There's like uh, so it was so calm and so still and like almost eerie. like yeah, it, it 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 felt like it was it was the time. It honestly felt like it was the time. And um, to be able to pick up that phone, even though I wasn't going to tell my brother, it was still the hardest thing I had to do. And he luckily knew the warning signs in my voice and he knew what I was going through prior to calling yeah. him. He jumped in his car and he comes straight over and picks me up, which is the critical moment that saved my life. My brother saved my life at that point. He took me in and uh, had me for... It would have been two months but the first month it was all about getting me my weight back on and looking after me giving me the love i needed you know like really showing me and making me feel the person that i needed to feel at that time um he had one rule i didn't smoke or you know bring anything around his uh, newborn baby which i was mate you invited Easy, me uh, yeah. yeah you invited me put me under a roof you know it's the least i could do so uh I respected that and uh, I still didn't come clean then. I, I was still smoking pot. He used to just go off. He, he lived at the back of the Rang State Forest. I used to go in there, spark up a doobie and that was for the first month. And then on, uh, I found out a week before October 2nd, 2016, that he signed me up for a 25K trail race and uh, mm. no training, no idea. He just had one thing. He said, mate, Give it your best crack. If you got a hike, you hike. If you run, you run. He's like, just go out and enjoy. Just do it. You got nothing to lose. Like, what have you got to lose? You're sitting here moping around, and I said, you know what? I'll give it a crack. 25 k's. Never in my wildest dreams. I was just like, I'll do this, and you know, make him happy. You know, that's that was my idea. Oh, mate, it changed my life. I laced up my shoes. It took me three and a half hours. But in that three and a half hours, it was the first time I was able to feel like I was in the present moment. Mm. I felt pain. I felt the suffering. I felt it all. But it was the first time no negative thoughts was crossing my mind. Or, yeah, it was just... I actually remember that day like it was yesterday. And it was a, a life-changing day because my, at first my brother come and saved my life. But now running. He's almost like giving you life. Yeah, now. exactly. But now it's like the running's what's keeping me going yeah. with life. I always have something to work for. And uh, yeah, so I finished that race, gave him a hug and I look, at, look up at him and I said, I want to run a marathon. So one month after that, we flew to Port Douglas and ran a, um, a marathon. Well, he ran the ultra, which is was 79 Ks. And I ran the marathon, 42.2 Ks. It's a mixture of a bit of sand, uh, trail road. Mm. So a bit of a di more difficult one for my uh, first first one as well as in scorching humidity. I think it was like one of the hottest days on record there really? too. So I had all these elements and I mean, I did that marathon in five hours and 53 minutes, but it was just a fact I could look down at my legs after and just go, wow, these things. Look what you just did. Yeah, yeah these things took me 42.2 kilometers and you know, from going from a yeah, bedridden uh, vegetable, I guess you can say, to you know, someone that can walk, run, you know, 42.2 Ks. After that one, I turned and I said, I want to do an ultra marathon. And a month after that, I laced up the shoes again. Mind you, I was doing training for these. My yeah. brother's, uh, my brother was coaching me because he coached a few people at the time. Um, gave me a coaching program to, uh, a training program to, to follow. And I followed that, did the marathon, did the ultra. And from then it's just sparked that fuel. And since then I've done 100 Ks, 50 milers and, yeah, oh, there's bigger and better things than I've got planned for myself. It's it's only the beginning. So that's been been the best three years of my life and it's all because of my brother and running. Dude, it's fucking incredible. Like it's a, yeah, that that's such a crazy story to come from the depths of setting a chair up to kill yourself to running a fucking ultra marathon. Yep. You know, and it, it goes to show like, what purpose can do for somebody when you've got a goal and you've got a reason to want to achieve that goal but it's like it's something i've been thinking a lot about lately is like the fucking harder you make the thing the more reward you get out of it like it shit has to be hard there's no nothing good comes from 
something that is easy an easy goal something you know it's easy to turn on a tv remote click into netflix and watch a show like that's easy like you might get a little bit of like a laugh through it or you might get something but there's not there's no lasting sustenance there because you turn that show off it's like it's done there's nothing hard but to go out you, you, there's no free ultra marathon finish you know like you've really you kind of have to earn that and it's something i've been thinking about a lot lately like i said with like my jiu-jitsu and stuff like it's fucking hard to go there every day yeah. it's hard to put your body through that it's hard to get choked repeatedly it's it's not easy and but yet it's the most rewarding thing and it's like what you just said before about your brother and you're like how can this be fun bro you end up in the back of an ambulance every time you do it but it's like in that hardship is where you find out who you really are yeah it's making friends with uh uncomfortable situations like i mean i that's one of my things is seeking comfort in discomfort so mm. um mate i one thing i can tell you my up until this moment project 31 i used to think about finish lines times and places it's not all about that. I used to forget about the journey that actually got me to that start line. Mm. The journey that the, the hundreds of thousands, of, the thousands of kilometers to get me just to that start line for each race meant more or should mean more than the actual race itself because of all the time, dedication and, you know, being strict and not doing this and, you know, giving away your your, your social life to be able to, to, to get to that finish line is what should mean more than the actual race itself. So, mm. which uh, Project 31 gave me that. I uh, put seven months of solid uh, training into it where normally I'd race every two months. So, putting racing aside and actually being able to appreciate the journey to get me to the start line which was marathon day number one and to be able to stay in the present moment for 31 days straight well actually 27 days but i'll get into that yeah. uh, later on but yeah being able to stay in the present moment for that amount of time and to be able to appreciate not only the 31 marathons and everything that happened in the in that space of time but it allowed me to to appreciate the whole journey that yeah. got me there all the time and effort other all my practitioners and and everyone put into me to to get me to there to to seek that goal you know so it was it was it's rewarding the thing what, what you say about like being in the present moment when you're in that stage of like complete depression uh, to the point of suicide like do you feel like you're barely living in your body at that point it's you're only living in your head and you're thinking about either the past and the things you've done wrong or the future and that what might not be there for you like because i mean i've definitely i've had uh there's definitely been times in my life where i have been depressed but I wouldn't say it would be to the point where I can't get out of bed and I can't, you know what I mean? Like, so I'm just trying to, I want to learn about that experience from, from where you were. And it's like, I think that when you say being in the present moment, so does that mean that when you are in that depressed or like suicidal state, it's like, you're not in your body, you're not in the moment. All you are is just inside your head. Is that like how it sort of works? Yeah, it's mate, it's, you'd nailed it on the head depression's living in the past you're constantly thinking about you know things that, that have happened which you can't change like you can't change the 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 outcomes of things that have already happened it's you can't go back in time and i mean you've you've nailed it on the head with the the anxiety as well because you're, you're worrying about the future far too much and you're not yourself so be, allowing yourself to stay in that present moment you feel uh, well, I know when I'm in the present moment, I almost don't feel pain. I barely have thought, like especially when I'm moving in the present moment, barely have thought and that's what's allowed me to run 1,308 kilometers, you know, like allowing myself to sort of become one, a, a whole unit and allowing myself to not have any negative thoughts and not thinking about the outcome of waking up tomorrow with a sore leg or you know i should have eaten more yesterday because like that, that's same thing living in the past or mm. thinking about the future which i couldn't have done that in project 31 because the, the task at hand was so great that mm. if i wasn't in that present moment which on day 27 oh i uh, ended up almost chucking it all in because of my head 
I diverted from the course of the the project and started thinking about you know the finish line and 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 how long I've got to go because anyone who's ran a marathon would know yeah. that 42 k's is a decent task in itself. Even though I've ran 27 or 26 before that, it was still a massive task to process the the remaining for me, and that's what really you know sent me sideways. It fucked me up. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it, it's yeah that uh that making friends with your like your own sort of enemy in a way like that's really you you have to like reconcile like there was a i can't remember where i heard it but this guy was just talking about um being in the moment and like because he hated being in traffic and it was like you can either push back against that you can resist it and you can be like fuck i wish i wasn't here and blah 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 and i wish this i wish like think of all the other places that you could be or you could just accept that as of right now there is no other place that you can be so just be here yep acceptance as well that was my whole goal for project 31 acceptance accept that it was going to hurt like anything except that you know there might be days that i would have to walk there was one day i had to walk that marathon day 27 even though it was my body that was letting me down it was my head and i had to accept that and i almost didn't i if i didn't have my cousin with me Kale, and uh a friend another friend jess i probably would have pulled the pin and day 27 like you're deep into it at yeah that point. That, i mean that would have just like i would have been sitting here right now just going why what yeah and uh every day i had reason to run so project 31 was about dedicating 31 marathons to 31 stories of uh so i had people that uh, lost their husband to suicide people lost their son to suicide um i had um, one of my good mates, he lost his father to suicide and they uh, shared their story. And um, that's what gave me the purpose to run. Every day I got up, I knew why I was running. Mm. It was almost like clockwork. I woke up, but on day 27, it was one of the very few days I actually didn't have anyone to run with as well. So finding that why on that day was far greater than every other day as well. Mm. So like I went through some of the most gnarly physical pain i've ever been through in my life and quitting didn't even cross my mind one of my marathons i had to stop every hour is day 21 I had to stop uh, every kilometer sorry and swing my legs out uh, i had sciatic nerve pain pretty much mm. from day three um, on my left side all the way to the end but on my right side so it was both because steps you were compensating yeah exactly so day 21 didn't even it was the worst pain i've ever been in my life like ever stopping every kilometer to swing my legs out to run another kilometer that the moving time was four and a half hours but the actual marathon took me seven hours something i still didn't even question because my like head you was were gonna finish yeah, yeah, yeah i knew i knew yeah. exactly what i had to do i knew who i was running for that day and at the end i i, I accepted that there was going to be pain from the start where mm. i think one of the things that i didn't accept at the start was my the you know my head like i knew my head was strong i've been my upbringing um, is what gets me through all my races. Like my mental resilience from my upbringing is, that's what I call on every time. Like, And so the, what, what do you think was uh, gave you those attributes? Like what was it about your childhood? Uh, just having to fight every day since I was 16, you know, the voices in my head that are telling me to- So is that to, when it started? Like it was directly coincided with your girlfriend at the time getting cancer? Like you'd never had any sort of problems no, up was, until then? No, I was a typical happy guy, you know, going to going to school. Like I think it's it, it takes a bit of hardship or, you know, adversity in life to sort of trigger. Some people are born with mental health um like it was it's in my family too like my mm. mother suffers from it my father so um it just needed yeah i guess it was just one of those things it was that as long as a, a multiple other things like it was it was yeah probably bound to happen but that's when i started noticing yeah. change in my my uh my my head so as well as like i didn't do any favors with all the partying and stuff yeah but. yeah i think that's like i i'm uh like I smoke weed now. Yeah. Um, but when I was a, like, I didn't do anything until I was like in my mid twenties and all my friends growing up were like fucked up bad all the time with drugs. And I just never did anything as a young kid. And I had some like, pro, like some family stuff that like kind of steered me away from it. But like, I look back now and I'm so thankful that when I did do that stuff was like, I was an adult and I kind of knew the choices I was making. I knew 
the what it can you know what it does to your body i knew like well when you do cocaine it's like you're releasing this chemical but then because you've released so much of it this is why this you know mm-hmm. i just feel like when you're a kid you don't really understand the consequences of like partying and i think that's where it can really fuck you up and like now with weed i look at weed as like a supplement to my like the same as having protein and sleep and you know i but i go in with that headspace like i'm never going into smoking weed is just to be like oh, i'm just gonna get fucked up you know like yeah. as you kind of do when you're a kid but i think it's that's definitely like it is uh, it is so important to like not go down that road young because you just you don't have the education on drugs to start with and your brain is just like still a fucking infant like you've really do have like you know because how old are you now i'm 27 yes yeah, so, i mean think about when you were 17 how much growing you've done like even as a 27 you're still like crazy young so it's like yeah that that shit when you're young is like not a it's definitely not a good thing to spend a lot of time doing eh? and that's a thing a lot of people um you're hearing stories of like 12 year olds jumping on it now and it's just like it's all well and good and it can be used safely later on in life but when your head's not fully you know developed yeah it's yeah it's a recipe for disaster yeah you know you're not you're not having your direct train of thought as well and a lot of the kids get addicted to these sorts of stubs substances at an early age and they say it's a gateway drug i i can probably vouch because that was the first ever drug that i ever tried yeah. and i enjoyed that so much and it's like oh you know that was fairly chill i'll go take a a pill now mind you i started doing that stuff when i was 18 like when i was in the nightclub scene yeah, and the festival yeah, yeah. and then but long and behold it's you know you get exposed and before i knew it i was racking up lines of ice and racking up lines of coke and doing all that sort of stuff and it's just like i can't say that pot is a gateway drug but i mean if you start at, it a, is. at a younger age where you know it doesn't really do too much well you don't think it does too much to you but then later on it's like oh i did pot when i was like 16 17 and did nothing there so i'll start trying this stuff and start doing yeah. that and like being around it as well like i had pretty gnarly mates so yeah well i think that the big thing why i think because i i definitely like i'm i'm almost like a weed advocate really like for certain uses for certain people in certain situations like i think everything has its place um but i think that what makes weed such a gateway drug is that like that's the one that your parents and the schools and everyone tells you is like the worst thing and like stay away you can't do this it's a gateway but and then you have your first fucking you have your first join or you fucking hit a bong for the first time and like nothing bad happens yeah and then you're like what the fuck like all you've done is tell me how bad bad this is and it's like it's not that bad so i think that is where then you're like oh well they said fucking ecstasy is really bad and then they said coke's really bad and then you know it you start to get this roll-on effect of like well they lied to me about that so they must be lying about everything else because they don't want me to have fun and i think that is where it is that gateway because it just gets painted out as like the worst thing ever whereas i think that if you if there was like a different angle to where it's like well you know what there's like some therapeutics benefits to it there's definitely people that can benefit from anxiety in there but it doesn't really work for everyone and anyone that is going to be like i know highly functioning stoners that will like they'll be stoned all day every day and they're like that's their most productive they're world champions at this or they're like one of my friends is one of the best photographers in the world in his industry fucking stoned all day but it's like that's not everybody and it's like i think it's just the education to where it's like you just if you told people what it was from the start then you wouldn't get that like have the first joint with your mates and it's a really great experience and then you're like well they're fucking lied to me so i think like i would agree even as a person that is like an advocate for like the positive uses of marijuana it's like i i definitely can't say it's not a gateway drug because what happens is you do it and then you're like it's not that bad and then you do this and this and then you just go down the rabbit hole but because like all fucking drugs can you can have a positive experience on everything alcohol, like alcohol alcohol fucking that, everything dude even you go to you go to hospital with a broken leg and they give you morphine yep. that's heroin yeah it feels fucking awesome <laughs> yeah like yep. it feels you've got a broken leg and I, i'm not in pain like that's not a bad experience that's a fucking great experience but the problem is the abuse of 
chasing that great experience yeah abuse mate of chasing anything like, like you said prescription medication there's so many people out there that that's their drug of choice yeah and i mean you can fairly easily go get prescription medication it's like it's just like you can fairly easily go to your drug dealer and get your pot your yeah. your coke or whatever your your drug of choice is so i mean anything in moderation like well yeah like pot or whatever i'm sure that's not but gonna i think be. even like i feel like maybe that's even too broad of like anything in moderation it's like you just got to know what's like good or bad yep. for you yep. and it's like if it's bad for you don't fucking don't do, do it, it. Yeah. you know if it's good for you do, do it, it. <laughs> and then if it starts being not good for you don't do it you know like there just has to be like a more of a like a balanced approach to that shit being aware as well of how you know how it is affecting you like yeah. if it's like you said, if it's affecting you in a negative way, well, guess what? Sort yourself out, sort it out, and either get rid of it or, yeah, find find different avenues to go down. Like, yeah, it's... And, like, chocolate can affect you in a negative yep. way. If yep. you eat 17 blocks of chocolate, that you know, like, yep. it's... A, gluten can affect you. And there's so much stuff where, it, like you said, you just got to sort of be self-aware. Yep. But was there a point where, like, say, like, fucking racking up ice and shit, like, was there a point where you thought, like, you were you were out of control but you couldn't stop or did you you just got to like a really bad place and you're like holy fuck how did i get here or did were you sort of aware of it on the road to that but you couldn't stop it no i was uh wasn't aware of it because uh the people i used to hang out with it was normal that yeah. was the normality of me yeah what are you boys doing tonight let's get a case and whatever it may be a baggie of cake let's get let's get on it that was just normal so when you're hanging around, I guess, a group of people, then that is like a normal thing for that circle. Well, it just becomes normality then, doesn't yeah. it? Just just like now I hang out with a bunch of maniac ultra runners and that run, you know, we might go pack up our bags and just do an 80K run on a weekend just for a training run. like Just for shits and giggles. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like it's what you expose yourself and it's what you're around, I, I find, you know. Yeah. But once I had a falling out with them and started coming back to reality, I was like, well, what the fuck was I doing? Like, that was so stupid. I did that, did that. And it almost become like, I kind of felt like a shit human being for doing all that. And that yeah. sort of played like a even more part of, you know, getting my, not, well, trying to get my head sorted, but it's like, what's the point of sorting my head when I feel like a shit human being for doing that? It's just yeah. Like, Guilt's a motherfucker, man. Like, is. guilt is, there's definitely... I feel like um, because I I like to really try and audit myself and like where I'm at and audit my happiness audit my sadness like get you feel like I really want to understand why am I sad why am I happy what's giving me joy what's bringing me uh, happiness what's bringing me uh, anxieties what's what's am I scared of what and it's like that guilt is one that just sets like knowing you should have done something better knowing you could have done something better knowing you let somebody down like they're the things again that's like what you said it's in once it's done it's done but that i think there is a lot of guilt that we carry i think that even uh society makes you feel guilty i think that like you said with you felt like you couldn't talk about stuff it's like there's a guilt there of like if i put this on that that person that like that's a definitely a very gnarly emotion that that you sort of have to wrestle with yeah i mean dealing with guilt and then uh as well as your your mental health it can be you know a snowball effect of you know you're feeling guilty because you've said this or you've done this and before you know it you're trapped in your own thoughts again and that snowball's building and building and building so yeah something's got to give at some point eh? yeah exactly and whether it be you know can take a year of you know feeling that or with in my case it took a couple of years before it got to that point and a few other you know life adversities but i think what you were saying before is being able to address things um, before it becomes too mm. much is a, a, and being self-aware. So yeah, be being aware of the things that make you anxious, being aware of things that, you know, fear you. Generally, things that fear me, I'll put myself right in that situation yes. because yeah. I find being uncomfortable I've, is, is a lot of self-growth uh, uh, being, being learned from that. So being uncomfortable in my runs and pushing myself in my running is uh teaching me a whole lot not only with my running but like how to deal with life and you know acceptance which is something i haven't been able to do like i'll be you know 60k into a run a 100k run and accepting that i'm puking my guts up and you know i've got pains in places i've never even thought you could get pains but being able to accept that knowledge being self-aware 
and then carry on. And that's something I haven't really been able to do with life. It would be like, well, up until I was 24, it'd be like, something would jump at me and it'd just be like, it would all just get too much. I'd freak mm. out and just like back away from anything. But now it's like, it gets too much. I push harder. I put myself more more involved with it just because I know the outcome will be far greater, far more rewarding than, you know, if I just went, oh, no, nah, it's too hard. Put yeah. it in the too hard basket, let it go. Yeah, I think that... Um like that's definitely i was just doing a, a podcast with a couple of friends that they do and, and we we're talking about like a lot of this sort of similar stuff and one of the things that i've been thinking lately is like you should chase excellence at something like in in life whether it's like silly it's got something to, nothing to do with your work or whatever but like for me like jujitsu is my thing where i'm like i want to be excellent at this because i feel like a lot of people will spend time looking for like these things that they want out of their life and it's like you look at anyone that's like the an ultra marathon runner, a uh, jiu-jitsu black belt, a motocross champion, a uh, fucking like you just name it, like whatever that it is. It's like the all the valuable lessons that they've learned through their life that makes them this person that people respect and admire. The lessons that got them to that point were like on the pursuit of being excellent because you do face so like excellence isn't easy man like it's not easy to uh to run an ultra marathon it's not easy to to get a jiu-jitsu black belt it's not easy to be the best surfer in the world it's not and it's like they're all of the things that you want from your life end up being this byproduct that comes from your uh like focus towards like attaining excellence in something and it's like you're sort of you're getting all of these peripheral benefits and it's like that's the stuff that you're seeking but like you don't have to go separately and go i'm gonna look for some confidence where do i get confidence from all right i'm gonna fucking read a book on confidence so it's like no if you you get confidence by i mean with me with the jujitsu stuff it's like i've got confidence now that i fucking train my ass off and that if i go to a competition i've i get confidence from how hard i've worked so it's like i didn't need to go anywhere else like i just you just go and you just show up and you go to the gym but it's moving towards like being excellent at something and i think that if you look at anybody that has like a certain level of excellence in any field whether you're fucking even a scientist a you know salesperson anything like you've learned lessons on the way to to doing that and i think that that you know people spend time like getting motivated and doing this and that like they're looking for these separate qualities that they want but it's like i feel like those qualities are all wrapped up in something that's just really fucking hard to get so like set your sights on something super hard and you're going to kind of attain all of those fringe like benefits as like a fringe thing yeah and another thing as well a lot of people don't set themselves these hard goals because of fear of failure yeah and i mean mate i've failed that many times in my runs to be able to, you know, dial in nutritionists. Like I had a nutritionist, Alethea Mills, work with me to a T to find out how much, you know, calories I would need to, to so I wouldn't get sick. I did 31 marathons without getting sick once. I've used, I'm known for pushing myself so hard and I'll throw my guts up. Yeah. But failure, I, I put my hand up I went on, you know, a, a radio station. I've been on like the, I knew there was a, a risk of failure, but I wasn't scared of that because I knew, yeah, if it was the case and I did fail in 31 marathons, so I wouldn't not ever run or I wouldn't not ever go to do the 31 marathons again. I'd figure out why I failed yeah, and I'd work on that and make that my strong point. You know, a lot of people are too scared to set, you know, a massive goal for for themselves in fear of failure like uh, that and I failed my first ever 100k race I ended up getting hypothermia in New Zealand and I learned a lot from that I learned not to train in a heat wave and go over there and run in next to nothing yeah you know like there was like and look after myself more where if I took the lesson out of that than I did at first and not want to jump back into running because I, I originally i was that scared from running i didn't want to run for for you know it was it only lasted a week but it was a week there then i was just like bet it was a long week though yeah because that was that's my escape i whenever i feel you know a confused which i was at the time because i was confused going i don't want to you know run anymore like what's the point i failed at this 100k like yeah. there's no chance it's like 
mate if i didn't fail that 100k there would have been so like there's so many more opportunities where i may fail later on as well yeah sorry dude i just gotta this fucking thing's tripping out um yeah no you, you you're so right and then there's like a fear of uh a fear of judgment that comes in there as well as like what are my friends gonna think what's my family gonna think like they're definitely a lot of elements come into play when it when it comes down to that fear of failure but i think it's just like a a perspective thing like what is failure like a failure to somebody like you could have the same person and they fail a 100k run but then you get the version one of you never runs again and then version two of you goes like oh man like i'll like i'm gonna train this way differently and it's like all that is is a matter of perspective that's in your brain like it's the same two people with a different perspective so it's like i think the challenge is a lot of times is to like be open to changing your perspective or if you if you're looking at something through like a negative lens and it's like okay that's my default setting right now what would a positive person think here and it's like just actively seek for you know the positive perspective it's like there's so much power in, in just your perspective alone yeah your perspective can uh you know change your direction of life as well like you could once have a perspective then you thought you're going this direction and it can completely go another as well so where running's allowed me to <laughs> go that other way as yeah well. like imagine that imagine yourself or your brother saying when you did that first trail run and your brother said hey man uh i don't know how to tell you but like in three years time you're going to run 31 marathons in 31 days you're going to change a lot of people's lives you're going to be an inspiration like and it's all because of this you probably wouldn't believe him or like it would it would seem that would be like a far out thing for you to conceive at that time but it's like you know you just don't know what the possibilities are yeah and possibilities are endless clearly like i've already got my next project in line for next year it, and i'd actually come up with that when i was in the deepest darkest moments of the project i yeah. was just doing as well but you're right like my brother could have told me that and i would have looked at him and laughed and it was it's been a journey but yeah it's crazy i'm yeah yeah no i mean it's it's fucking yeah it's it's so inspiring like i didn't realize the depths of the backstory like that was one of the things that i was excited to talk to you about is like where did this come from like you you first of all i think that like anyone that does anything extreme like there's got to be a certain level of fucking crazy that's going on in there and it's like but that crazy is like a good thing you know like that's what you can if you can become friends with that level of fucking crazy whether it's crazy determination crazy confidence crazy drive crazy whatever then it's like if you can make friends with that fucking crazy like you can do crazy shit so and it's like i was just i, I didn't really know the full backstory and but i knew that there was something because you cannot there is you the internal fuel that you have to burn to pull off what you accomplished is fucking remarkable yeah, and Livin actually, uh, Casey Lyons from Livin, he said, uh, he who has a reason why can almost bear any reason uh, reason how. Yeah. For any reason how. And that's like, I had every morning, I had my reasons why there with not only for my myself and uh, mental health and how much it actually meant to me, but like my mother, I was running every day for my mother and her mental health. I was running every day for people that can't yet speak. You know, there was so, there was so much fuel that I had to burn and I could burn so there's um there's definitely like a lot of power in uh accountability like when you go out and you say you're gonna do something like that's been one of the most positive effects that this podcast has had on my life is that when you start speaking to tens and tens of thousands of people and you say you're gonna do something like you need to fucking do it you know and there's there is like a uh a, a, a real power in like putting something out into the universe and then holding yourself accountable to it and then other people holding you accountable to that to that thing yeah and accountability was a lot of my project because as i said 31 almost 31 people put their hand up and were willing to share their story and uh that kept me accountable to get down to the pirate park at 7 a.m every morning and run 42.2 k's and 
um like that was my reason why like i had that that person whether it be to draw strength on whether it be someone losing their 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 son to suicide you know and i said i went and met up with the the lady herself and like seen her pain in her eyes and i could really draw back on that and when i was hurting i'd close my eyes and i'd think this is just physical pain yeah emotional pain is the worst kind of pain and i'll tell you right now 2016 was the hardest time in my life emotionally and full stop 2019 and she's gone august that was hard physically but may i tell you right now that was not even a little hair a little freckle on my skin compared to the mound that i had to climb uh in 2016 and people that are suffering through emotional pain out there just realize that's more than any physical pain i've ever been through yeah that's um fuck, yeah that's a it's crazy to even think of that because anyone that's even run 5k's like there's a lot of pain that is involved in just being a regular joe running 5k's right yeah what um what was like your reason to keep going back then when it was so tough like if it was that bad like was it just your family yeah i had family i had work like i did have reason to keep going but it's just like when you get caught up in such a negative uh mindset you just can't stop the the mind chatter which i mean when i'm running i get mind chatter i get mind chatter like you wouldn't believe my headset commuting to my body saying this hurts stop this hurts stop but i'm so used to that from you know my upbringing my mind just ticking a million miles an hour going what are you doing stop doing that you're doing that wrong like constantly going so that's why i've definitely built the mental resilience from my upbringing and which has allowed me to mm. push through project 31 so we'll get into the actual project itself so what was involved in like actually making it happen and did it did it come together as easy as you sort of hoped or well with the help of the community it come together better than what i ever ever imagined so i had physio carl wees working on the body i uh, multiple treatments i had uh re from being gc chinese medicine i seen her every day every night looking after my strapping to massage to acu to cupping every morning every night like she was my go-to girl and then uh i had a nutritionist alethea mills work on my diet um dialing everything to the point where she, i was with performance eating that i would get meals but i was eating that much and my my diet completely changed once i actually started the project so she was actually making me food and bringing it over to me like so i, I couldn't I, for the first 10 days i could barely even walk but i could run yeah right. so i couldn't stand over like i had to minimize my time on my legs and me living on my own every 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 morning i'd have to wake up on my own to my alarm so i didn't have someone bringing what me what time in, are you waking up uh four o'clock so i'd give myself you know good fuck yeah every morning i give myself a good three hours to because i spent like an hour in a recovery um p3 lent me some uh pressurized oh, like, garments yeah yeah that's so good so i'd spend like a, an hour every morning before even going out just in them i'd have to eat ridiculous amount of food so every morning was 12 week big six crumpets and then i'd jump in for an hour like it was clockwork so i was eat brekkie jump in my boots for an hour and then it would roll on the uh, foam roller for you know 45 minutes and then re would come down massage me tape me up and then do all that so and then i had massage therapists like um coxie and and pagey work on me and like so it was a, a community working and helped me achieve my goals but it was also the community um like when i was running as well so i'd be like running through burley and i remember on day 21 the locals knew me that well by my my facial expressions that if i was in pain so one of this uh, I, I hit burley and i i couldn't talk on day 21 because of my sciatic nerves so i actually put a post out saying i'm gonna have to start this one on my own have music in and people can jump on it was the first one and only day that you know you I actually had, to, had music and stuff yeah i had to be on my own like yeah. i just i can only just stare at the ground and just had to really focus and i had like old old dudes slap me on the eyes going come on jakey you marathon 21 buddy keep going and it's like things like that and really boosted the the your like morale morale up man and like far out like i had um on day uh marathon day two i met uh two lovely people 
um, Mudgy and his um, partner Izzy. They brought me over food. They uh, to the point where Izzy um, Izzy does uh, bond cleans. They even clean my unit for me because like me being me, I'm living on my own and like yeah, things got like, a bit much. And yeah. I just put that there, put that before I knew it. The place was a pigsty. And yeah, mate, like to the to the fact then she come over and like clean my unit for me and just so I wouldn't have to you know use up any energy and uh the amount of people i met on that journey dude holy dooly i met some really amazing people that i now i'm so stoked to have in my life isn't it crazy that like one month can literally just change your entire life and that's the thing i was a trade i don't even want to go back to work anymore i want to invest all my time into um providing help and support for mental health now like i was a comms tech for nine and a half years i'm uh not going back into that that's it's changed my life completely it's uh even like to the point where for my last marathon i wanted to go out with a big bang and run a double marathon and do all this more fundraising and stuff and it's just like why would i get greedy and take you know try to take the whole pie when you know i've ready i, I had a goal to raise five thousand dollars i did that i'm up, up, up to You're 20 up to like 20 something right? 20 something grand and that's like with the, again help of the community um and it was like, so I've done the fundraiser. I'm like, I said I was going to run 31 marathons. I'm going to do that. Why Why take the whole pie? Like, just be happy with what I've got. And that's something I've never been able to do. I've always been, you know, trying to be extravagant and do everything like the best and the biggest. And it's like, I want longevity in this sport too. If I did that double marathon, potentially could have fucked my knee or, mm. you know. So it's definitely changed my life. And I'm so, so happy that I had living, you know, as my... Uh, as a, to fundraise for because they made my life a lot easier as well mm. and i mean they they got people helping me and to the point where i rocked up on the saturday the last marathon and the whole burley hills covered in people and it's yeah, just like, that's so sick just goes to show mental health man it's, it's around us it's everywhere and it yeah. affects people and you know different ways shapes or forms so there's um it's something that like we talk about on <laughs> on here a lot like people just different people i think like everyone goes through uh struggles and i think like that's been one of the cool things doing this podcast is like you know you get people that like that's some people's heroes that are on here and then they're talking about like oh dude like it was a fucking struggle and i had to do this and like you kind of uh when people are vulnerable it's like everybody goes through that but like have you put much thought into why you think it is such a problem in like our modern society that we live in i just i think especially with males there's that male masculinity that we don't want to you know show our emotions show feelings and it's like fuck we've all got them like mate i can tell you right now your biggest muscliest men out there would have emotions and have feelings like we're all human beings like at the end of the day and uh one thing with this project I had met allowing myself to become vulnerable has allowed other people to open up and become yeah. vulnerable. And like, I can tell people out there right now, there's a lot of people struggling with mental health. And like I said on, I think it was day nine, there was a fairly decent group of us. There's probably about 10 of us running. And uh, there was a, a, a youngish kind of dude and he's uh, opened up and he said the things he told us he hasn't even told his own family yeah so it's kind of created like a little that little like safeguard safe area yeah for people and it's it's the same with living you see someone with a living hat or a living shirt on you know they're across mental health and mm. it, it can be a conversation starter even like they're quoted ain't weak to speak you see someone with a living hat i know if i You're was on that same level yeah if i was to speak to someone randomly out of the blue it'd be someone like you know with like mental health or living a charity on their their head you know like it's, it's a conversation starter that's for sure mm. so was it uh like what was the training that you then did like in the seven months that led up to august 1st so i um i got mentored by a squad run so normally it's a new zealand based um coaching um company over there and I had had programs with them previous, but my coach at the time couldn't really structure a, a program for me to be able to do that. So he was mentoring me, but the idea was to start off running six days a week and only 50 Ks. So it wasn't much at all, especially me. I was- I'm Yeah, that bit, would have been like, fuck, that's a step back. Yeah, I know. Being an ultra runner, you should have sit on about 120 Ks, 100, 
10 K sort of depending what you're a week. Yeah. What you're, what you're training for. So I was taking that step back and, uh, towards the end, and it do was, you know, the theory behind doing that. Well, it was more so it's called load phasing. So I was trying to load kilometers on my body with, uh, without going drastic and putting heaps of K. So then I'd blow, you know, calves or blow my knee out or ankle. It's just, yeah, conditioning the body to be able to withstand, um, my goal of running it was Mm. actually my my idea was to train myself to run seven marathons and once i completed those first seven marathons it would get my body ready to be able to complete the rest and um so towards the end of the project i was sitting on about seven uh, running seven days a week um and sitting on about 180 k's and to the point where on a weekend i would run like back-to-back marathons and then I, i did a little thing where if i raised i think it was like $1,000 $1,000 by this time I'd run seven half marathons in the week record them all as well as I was doing split shifts at work so one minute I was in Sunshine Coast doing a night shift and then uh, I'd finish my night shift and I'd be in Crumman Valley doing my uh, doing my half marathon so that's when it my project started creating the movement because people were like fuck this dude's legit he's, he's like actually serious about yeah, this he's, shit he's gonna he's gonna you know give it a red hot crack at least and um, yeah so I was loading my biggest thing was i mind you i actually got an injury after gold coast marathon so i was sitting on about a little bit silly of myself i was sitting on about 170 k's i think just before gold coast marathon 180 k's and i uh and none of my work's been speed work i got a little bit excited at gold coast marathon and took off way too fast and uh did something to my hip so i toned the pace back a little bit and then something went in my hammy so then I walk around the last 12 Ks of Gold Coast Marathon. I think I did it in three and a half hours and I wanted to go about 3.10. Yeah. Um, but I was on track to go probably about three hours. <laughs> so I was like way, way too excited. Yeah. Um, so the last, the three weeks before um, my project, I um, had to tone it right back, which is not what I not wanted what to. what you wanted. But it was one of those things as well. It's like, as you would know, if you're training two, three weeks out to an event, you're not going to get any fitter yeah you're just going to maintain that fitness so it was a little bit of a you know a shit time for me but it was also acceptance accepted that i fucked up except then i got a little bit of a niggle i never call them injuries unless it puts me out yeah so i was still running i still was sitting on about 50 60 k's but i still wanted to maintain sort of like 100 sort of work my way back down because it was ended up being 200 and 95 kilometers per week yeah, for the month right. of august so that's um, fucking gnarly dude i wanted to sort of you know maintain at least you know the 100 plus k's before jumping into that but it all worked out all my training and that all boils down to self-belief as well i believed in my training i believed in myself and it was just i believed why i was running was for the right reasons yeah 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 doing it for the right reason um, when you first started doing the just like your first trail run and stuff like that like do you think that you've got a bit of natural ability to like let you sort of do it and that's what kind of kept you into it or no because I made I was far from the fittest person I used yeah. to smoke an ounce of pot a week before running so my lung capacity and stuff wasn't really up to, to scratch so I think do you think you've got like a natural like good lactic threshold though that you can kind of or you just think you've just really come to like push past the pain yeah I, it's hard to say because um if you have a look at my family like of my mother and father aren't really like the fittest people yeah. as per se but then if you look at my brother he's been practically a professional hockey player, hockey player he's been very good at cycling and he was very high up in the uh, ultra running scene in australia so but then my oldest brother he's just like a gym junkie and my littlest brother he's a little menace but he's sorting himself out so <laughs> so it's one of those things i i think more so my upbringing i strongly think that the like, mentality is what yeah because like i speak to a lot of other endurance athletes and um a lot of them have had their hardships and that's why they've you know yeah and a lot of endurance athletes hit their sort of midlife crisis and start doing ultra jumping in the ultra scene when they're like 35 which ages this a number i'm stoked i got into it younger because young you yeah. i've got i've got years to sort of train up and get into it but a lot of my mates are like 35 40 years old and they're fucking animals yeah there's shit all over me this put me to shame 
So, well, that's what you look at. Um, that Courtney Dillwater chick. Oh, she's a legend, and it's like she's just a fucking psycho. Drinks beers, eats burritos, and that's <laughs> that's that's rad. That's what it's about. Like, yeah, because I guess like you get to a certain point where it's like. Like, physically, a human's not really designed to run an ultra marathon, right? Like, really, like, we're not, that's not what we're built for. Like, there's other shit in the animal kingdom that is built to run for super long distances. So, like, it's, there's, there definitely has to be, like, a part of it that is, like, a genetic thing and, like, an athleticism thing. But, fuck, surely when you're in that ultra marathon territory, it's just about your mental capacity to just be a savage and that's the, that's that's me like i strongly think it's about 80 percent mental 10 percent physical and 10 percent nutrition and fuel like it's all up in your ticker like i went and did that 25k but a month after i went and did a marathon i wasn't the fittest dude like they back back in the day they said you could it was dangerous to run a marathon yeah true now i've got i hang out with mates um steven wright he's an absolute legend he's one week he ran a 200 miler in Narang, so that's 320 kilometers in Narang State Forest. Fuck, there's those freaks just living amongst us. And then jumps on the plane the next day and drive, uh, and then flies to Adelaide and runs around a track for 48 hours, comes first place. So it ended up being over uh, close to 600 kilometers in one week. He did. So that's the people I hang out with, and you know that's what's put in my head. Yeah, yeah. It's, isn't it crazy though like to go back to like the people that you were hanging out with were like pushing you to do drugs and shit and it's like that mentality of like we're fucking going harder going harder going harder but then it's like you can take that exact same mentality but then just transfer it into running and like how's the fucking difference that it has on your life right well and just like where you ch- we all have that energy in us so it's like if you can be a fucking animal on the piss or on the drugs like you can be a fucking animal everywhere you've just got to choose that place to like put that energy right and i mean ultra running is like a bender you get uh no sleep <laughs> and you get feelings like you've never felt before like my first ever 50k was a uh, misty mountain 50k and i remember it like it was better than any drug i've ever fucking taken in my life the feeling of Oh, it was just so overwhelming just like crossing that, that runner's high right oh man it, it's a runner's high that's exactly what it is and like i remember my, my brother's very straight laced doesn't touch anything like very clean cut he's a rescue crewman like um rescues people out of helicopters and stuff like he's very straight and i turn and i'm like mate no wonder you don't do drugs like mm. this is the drug this is my drug of choice now like pushing yourself to a point where you know you think you can't go any further and then you push past that another 20 kilometers and it definitely releases the endorphins through your body then you know you probably get from a a, a drug or mm. yeah and it's like that i get that's sort of what we were saying before is it's like when you fucking push yourself like the the biggest rewards come from like the gnarliest hardest most fucked up thing that you can think of like this shouldn't be possible this this won't work i could never do that that it's like when you do that shit like i had i had to have a few weeks off training and then i went back to training and i just like i left and i was just like holy fuck like i felt like i was on fucking crack dude i was like got in my car and then i just like turned the music up crate like people would have looked at me like i was fucking psycho but I was just, I was high. Like I hadn't done my like training. I hadn't been in that room like that. I hadn't got that feeling that I got from just fucking going as hard as I can. Like, and being in the moment, like nothing else matters when you, there's a, literally a dude trying to fucking choke you to death. Yeah. It's like that brings out like that certain, I don't know. It's like you tap into like a primal, I don't know, reptile brain type thing, right? It's like a flow state. It almost mm. almost becomes autopilot. You know exactly what you got to do. Like for you, you know how to counteract certain mm. ma- maneuvers. With me, I get stuck in a flow state and I know what I have to do. I know that there's going to be pain and it's just a matter of quieting down the mind, shutting everything out and just putting that left foot, right foot. Mm. Keep well, the flow going. I think um, like anyone that does anything and I think that, again, it's like a perspective thing. Like, if you're into boxing, if you're into jiu-jitsu, if you're into running, if you're into swimming, if you're into uh, cycling, if you're into mountain biking, whatever it is that you're into, 
like you're meditating yeah. really like that's what you know like you think about meditating and meditation as like kind of a hippie thing you're sitting down you're um you know breathing Sending and out. mantras and it's like well yeah that's that's like the most traditional way that you would think about meditating but like when i'm doing jujitsu i'm literally meditating i'm out of my mind like there's nothing else all i'm doing is just reacting in the moment and it's like there's certain things what i'm thinking about or i'm planning or whatever and like you know just try and strategy towards like winning that match but it's like i'm not thinking about my phone bill i'm not thinking about how much fuel is in my car i'm not thinking about any of the problems that i've got like it's just purely living like you're just existing in that that moment you know and it's like that is what meditation is like that's what you're trying to do is quiet the mind and i think that i didn't think about it like that for a really long time and it was the same as like i'm really into mountain biking and motocross but it's like i'm not thinking about anything because there's like consequences to your mind drifting off like you're gonna crash so it's like there's a certain again it's like that primal thing that's like locking you into that moment because there is like physical consequences if you don't pay attention yeah and i'm like my meditation's running yours is jiu-jitsu i mean it doesn't have to be physical as well i got tattoo artists and sit down yeah for multiple hours and uh one of my one of my tattoo artist mates he um actually tried committing suicide jumping off a bridge failed and he wasn't a tattoo artist or a drawer before then he finds happiness and content in sitting there he's done drawings for 15 hours straight yeah just sits there and draws draws you don't have to be out pushing your limits in you know your running or jiu-jitsu or cycling like it's just meditation is allowing you to be in the present moment so whatever that may be like surfing was was what i thought was my present moment but running now is drawing art you know jumping going for a walk even doesn't yeah yeah whatever allows you to be in that present present moment is there other stuff that you like to do now like now that you've kind of achieved that like you can get into that state with running do you try and find it in other areas of your life and like harness that same energy um to be honest no but that's probably something that isn't a bad idea for me but i'm really loving exploring how far i can Mm. physically push myself as well as mentally with my running like my 31 marathons in 31 days i know deep down i can push myself more physically and mentally Mm. that duration of the time fucking killed me so i want to my next project's actually going to be shorter but like almost as much distance but shorter time frame Mm. just because it was so hard staying in clockwork for 31 days straight like that that added to the challenge and like that was cool but like i want to push myself more so physically Mm. like further in like a short amount of time so i was running off sleep deprivation pretty much from day three i found myself uh i could only sleep during the days and uh when my body was still a little bit active from the runs yeah and as soon as i went went down to have a sleep of a night holy shit the joints ached bones ached so it was a bit of a rough one but that was also getting into the routine so I would have my run that would last from seven till say 12 every day. And then I would have a two hour break where I'd have food and jump in my boots for an hour, have a nap. Then I'd get up and I'd have a float at like say Freedom Float or go to P3 or um, go to one of my appointments. But I was I was generally seeing probably like doing two treatments every day, whether that be like a physio, muscle balancing, acu, or, uh, or um, P3 or a float. And then it was just a matter of finding that routine and then sticking with it and then i found that 31 days was like super epically tough because of the duration of time to stay in the present moment yeah because uh, i lasted to like i said day 27 mine drifted off almost fucked everything up so so what happened on day 27 that that made it so tough and like when did you know like ah oh, fuck i'm losing it here a moment i woke up it was weird really the moment you wake up or i woke up every morning i would know it would pretty much depict my day like it'd be like all right you're in for a fucking treat or you're in for a fucking treat Mm. and day 20 uh, day 27 i woke up and i was very fatigued tired and it was a day that 
the sleep deprivation thing has just got to be so fucked for your head, eh? And it is like it 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 sucks being able to think clear. It as you would know, like when you're lacking sleep, pain, your pain threshold's so much. Yeah, it's just it's terrible. You feel every pain, and I was just like, my body. Every time I woke up, I'd put swing my first leg over, put it on the ground, and go, "Fuck, sweet, that one's not too bad." And then I get the other leg over, swing that one over, and I'd be like, "All right." that's not too bad but that morning i opened my eyes and i was just like fuck i'm fucked mm. i don't even need to feel my body i know like mentally i'm fucked got up everything took a lot longer to do like making my brekkie and everything was just mentally tough and like i can't believe you just did this like living by yourself yeah well i did have like you know my my mate like a, a mate uh, mudgy who i met on day two bring me food and yeah do things but um dude i can't barely get through my life living by myself like and, and just especially a, having a snoring pug sitting on the pillow next to you you wake up and it's just like your alarm's going off and it's just like all right i know why i'm running what i've got to do but fuck she looks comfy sleeping next to me i could oh, go back yeah. to bed right now and uh have a cheeky little nap so but yeah that was but it, it as you say it, the reward is so much greater not having someone shake me up every day going get up you know you gotta get this done gotta man. get this and that made the accountability factor even more for me like more i had to be down there at 7 a.m like some mornings that you know were a bit of a struggle and a couple i ran late by like 15 20 30 minutes but everyone that was in, involved understood oh yeah no one's gonna be like this motherfucker's late for day 27 of his marathon yeah so and that was at day 27 i was just so lucky my cousin kale who he's only been running a year and a half now he ran over the duration he set himself to run a goal he's an ultra distance runner now i got him into um got him in training with me he was a gym junkie and loved his gym still loves his gym but it's more um running specific now yeah and he ran seven marathons with me in that month. Still, he's a full-time uni student, works, you know, works his ass off, and he still set himself a goal to run seven marathons, which, mate, that's fucking ridiculous. Mm. Seven marathons in one month. Before doing my 31 and 31, I don't think I've done seven marathons in a month. So it was, uh, yeah, crazy. Yeah, that, they, fuck, I can't even imagine that. I, I got into doing... I had to stay up in Cairns for a little bit. Like, that's where I'm from. Yeah. And they do that park run on the Esplanade. And I was doing, like, 5Ks every Saturday. And I was just like, fuck, how do people do this shit, eh? But the f- that's the thing as well. A lot of people are comparing and going, oh, sorry, I can only do one marathon. But it's like, your one marathon could be my 31 marathons, you know what I mean? Like, it... It's all relative, eh? Yeah, it's all... Exactly, it's all relative. Like, my mum, which meant the most to me, there's video of and photos... The last 500 meters she walked with me, I, I didn't run the last 500. I walked up Burley Hill because that 500 meters for my mom was like a big a big thing for her. Because yeah. like she doesn't get out and walk like she's, that's not her. So like that 500 meters was probably like a full marathon to someone, you know? Yeah, so yeah. that in itself meant a lot. And another thing with this whole project, I had over 25 first timers run their first ever marathon, which is like Damn. massive. It like people seen what i was doing and it kind of gave them self-belief to be able to you know do it which it was a good pace as well like i was sitting on anywhere from six minutes to six thirty pace so it was like a nice comfortable flow and yeah that was uh super special as well having all those people you know achieve a goal than they set themselves and you, i can't remember what day i jumped on because like i said i fo- i started following you through andy jackman and uh but like even from the time that i jumped on to start following along it was like you could just see it was just more people just constant you know what i mean it's like the word spread it seems like it was a a really i don't know it was just such a cool thing to sort of watch from the outside in to be like damn look at the money he's raising every day you posted it was like i remember it being 12 10,000 12,000 14,000 16 you know so it's like you could really see that people embraced what you were trying to achieve yeah and the goal my goal was five thousand. that's so insane eh? It i just went blew to past that i went to live in and i said i've got a vision i want people more so to be out talking like it's rad like people chuck money in if they've got it but my whole point of this project 
was getting the community involved and getting the community out talking and the money was just like an extra you know and like 22 grand that that's just blown like four times yeah, four times yeah. what i was you know my goal was so crazy when you when you run like let's say the first day day one like at what point are you starting to like feel the pain kilometers wise it was probably about day three day five so like you could just run one marathon like like uh, at what point do you just do you have to start hitting the manual over override of like fuck i'm sore but you got to keep going well i've only ever before project 31 i was only experimenting with because the whole idea was a distance of a marathon so i was originally going to think about breaking them up into half marathons and 10ks because i didn't know what was happening so i'd only ever ran a back-to-back marathon two times yeah. before this training so i knew what how the body would feel after the two marathons so it was marathon three then i actually started feeling like you know oh that's a little bit different that's a little bit different but i did um 21 marathons without painkillers i uh my whole thing was i wanted to feel every step and uh well sorry i did 20 and a half marathons without painkillers i wanted to feel every step and uh be in control of my body so then i could go back to my physio or you yeah. know re and go you know i need extra treatment on this this is going on and then be able to work through that problem but it was uh day 21 that i needed and i mean when i mean painkillers all i take is panadol extra which is caffeinated panadol yeah um day five was the first day first of all uh day four um i went to bed and i was feeling a little bit you know run down and a little bit how are you going so uh i left dedicating a marathon my mother's marathon to a hard day so i dedicated her on day five i remember standing up out of my feet and you got like i can't don't know the exact bone but they're on the side of your feet they were fucking smashing me didn't even think i could bear weight on them really this is day five so people like legit break their feet in like ultras and shit eh? like you get stress fractures and stuff that's the thing that's something i wouldn't have been out of control but i accepted that i may have a stress fracture and then i was just gonna have to keep running like that was just part and parcel with what i was savages what i was you know this what i was gonna have to do so it was day five and dedicated that one to my mother her story and uh i remember standing out of my bed taking those first left foot out right foot out just going fuck all right it hurts but i know why i'm running i know what i got to do and day five was the first day i realized i couldn't walk but i could run Mm. so there was a good 15 days where i practically couldn't walk like could not walk so i would hobble down to you know the pirate park 7 a.m get there and then I'd just be like, all right, Jake, you know what you got to do? Start moving. Once I started moving, man, it was like the body within a K would somewhat free up, loosen up. I'd still have like my ankle would sore, like joints, knees, you know, calves. But then after a K, mine would silence everything down and it would just know what to do. Clockwork, back on, back on the clock. And um, from day five, that's, I guess, uh, you can say I transcended like i ran off my spirit like yeah i knew exactly what i um had to do i had to eat my food do my treatments look after the body go to bed sleep was a massive thing but unfortunately for recovery normally but unfortunately i i was running off sleep deprivation like i'd get three hours during the day that was my main sleep three one hours in my uh, pressurized boots and then it would be five hours waking up every half an hour no word of a lie five hours every half an hour just fuck all right get back to sleep i wonder why like medically what was going on there because oh. there's got to be something where like the body's just because there'd be that much cortisol in your system of like you know stress hormone being released right and like i have a mate um a couple of people that mentored me along the way who have done like 50 marathons in 50 days and um i'm not too sure if anyone or any of the listeners um the Iron Cowboy, he did 50 Ironmans. And 50, What's his name? Um, like, James Lawrence, I think it is. Yeah, okay. Iron Cowboy, so he did 50 Ironmans, 50 states, 50 days, and super rad because he um, messaged me actually during the Damn, August cool. as well, which is like super inspiring because like... You look up to him. I can't even comprehend what he actually did. 
Like I had the smallest little taste and that was gnarly. Like chucking a, you know, 180K bike ride and a 3.5K swim as well as travel logistics. Take my hat off to that man. But a lot of those dudes were taking, you know, the the painkillers to keep, which I probably could have done of a night time. But I was like so worried about like my organs and everything, yeah. like, like the stress they're under. I didn't want to put them in. Under more stress with exactly. like your kidneys or your liver and 100%. stuff. 100%. So it was just like, I was more so focused on natural remedies like um, your magnesiums and I lived in like a magnesium bath. So yeah, your, your, Like the float pods, Freedom Float Center at Burley, that was like my quieting down. So that yeah. it was good for the, the magnesium uh, soaking through the body, but it was like you shut the lid. I used to take my watch off, take any distractions and it's just you in there. Majority of the time I'd sleep because that used to be like my little quiet, my little yeah, you know, quiet little zone. Spot. Yeah, yeah. So um, was it heavy like running um obviously you're like running four different people each day and then you'd be hearing these people's stories like was did it get heavy just like constantly hearing about all of these um these different stories and stuff to be honest it kind of has helped me heal with my own like it's given yeah, okay. me a big of under, better understanding of people like the as, bigger picture of mental yeah, health the, exactly and knowing that a lot of the years i, I spent thinking you know am i the only one out there suffering am i is it just me 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 when it's not it's you know everyone has adversity in their life it's how they deal with it or you know how things uh, are dealt with after it all which um a lot of the time i would something would happen and my reach straight to a drug yeah you know that used to me but now i'm finding people then open it up go through adversity but they'll deal with it differently now. Like for me, I chuck on my shoes and, you know, go for a run and hearing different people's coping mechanisms for, you know, different scenarios was also super, you know, good to, to know because when I'm t- talking to someone a, a, as well as if someone's talking to you about mental health, the best thing you can possibly do is listen. Mm. A lot of the time as well, like of this project, I did a lot of the time listening because a lot of people would open up to me and it's it's common that we go to try fix problems we always go try you know uh, rectify you know, you know fix a problem but some of the times it's like the best thing you can do is listen like we've been given two ears and one mouth for a reason use your two ears twice as much as you use that one mouth someone summons summon up the courage to come chat to you about their mental health which is a massive thing and i knew that was a massive thing with this project so I just did a lot of the time listening and yeah, it, it, it was rewarding, like hearing other people's stories and I didn't let it affect me. If anything, I drew from it as strength and uh, seeing someone become vulnerable is a strength of my own. So then I used it as a strength for them too. Yeah, the that whole, um, the whole like vulnerability thing is definitely something what I think vulnerability draws you to people like when somebody has the confidence or the peace of mind or the courage to be vulnerable and be open and be honest like that that's such an endearing quality and i think that the way that we sort of like you know you spoke before about like the male culture of like you can't talk about that sort of shit like just really shuts you down to a lot of people but i think that you know there, there's so much power in like being honest and being open and being vulnerable and i think that is one of the major building blocks of relationships is like if you can be vulnerable around this person then that shows that you know there's like such a i don't know like a trust and uh like a it's such a great basis for friendships and relationships because you know you are starting with that um you know, like the ultimate like vulnerability and it sort of that does show trust in a person right yeah and it allows well it's a more of a of an allowance as well like you becoming vulnerable it's like all right he's allowing me into his life mm. like i've put i guess you can say like i've stripped off my armor and showed everyone my insides you know like i don't care about talking about my mental health anymore where you would never see me speaking about the stuff we've spoken about today even 
a year and a half ago i'd speak to close friends and family um and like people then would ask me why all of a sudden because i mean doing what i've done i never was a runner and all of a sudden i've just popped up on the you know the running scene so yeah. a lot of people questioned you know my why and i would tell them but now i've jumped on you know national television and spoken about me wanting to take my life and you know 90 percent of the people i dedicated my marathons to were actually males which was super rewarding too yeah so it's like 90 percent of these males threw up their hand and said yeah i'm willing to you know share my story and in the in the hope to to help um someone else like one of my mates really good mate now who i only just met through the project i um seen him around the traps uh lukey he's got a story and me becoming vulnerable and opening up he has now shared his story and he's spent half his life in um you know locked up um addicted to ice and whenever he he come out he would jump straight back on the ice breach his parole be locked back up again now he's found um, tri- um iron man he ran his first marathon at gold coast marathon sub three hour marathon so he's a fucking savage he's as well. a beast he's a beast and um he's got a story now and he's going to inspire so many people by his walk of life where he was. He was homeless, you know, didn't have uh, uh, any role models or any influences in his life. And now he's someone that is going to be an influence, which yeah. is so fucking cool. Like, that's so rad. And uh, it took someone like myself to throw my hand up and say, this is where I've been. You almost gave him permission to do the same thing. Yeah, and like him telling me that is like man like so rad and like i've got a fucking special spot in my heart for that dude because he's been through a lot as well and like how he is with life he's got a family and kids now you know he's been clean for a year and a half and he's someone i look at and i got a lot of a lot of respect for and i know he's going to be clean for the rest of his life because he said that to me yeah that's fucking it's so cool like it's this there is so much power in in all of this and in you know like kind of creating the movement that you sort of had over that month and the effects will go on for so long yeah and project long haul which is my next one that's more so going to be a soul soul like myself and you know a team as well as uh, uh, a fundraiser for living again but my whole idea for project 31 was community based and yeah and not not as much funds but get people and mate i'm stoked with how it all went so happy um oh fuck what was i i had something right on the tip of my tongue that i was gonna i've been meaning to ask it like four times and i was like every time i was like oh yeah we're gonna say this go to this um fuck it was like the the logistics of it all that i was wondering fuck mind blank this shit's too good um so what like what's the Oh, that was what I was going to say. What was the thing that gave you the moment where you like initially just wanted to speak out in the first place? Like the first time you publicly spoke about your mental health, like what was it that kind of flipped that switch and you were like, you know what, I will talk about this? Well, I actually um, seen one of my mates, Kieran. Um, He's also an ultra runner. He did fundraising for living. He shared his story and I had similar sort of story as him and i seen all the the people that were like benefiting from it and i was like i've got different um a group of friends like different i guess social media networking to him maybe i could inspire and help someone out there and at the end of the day it ain't weak to speak like that's living's you know quote and mate i go by that 100 percent now because a lot of people even message me they're like I'm so stoked you you beaten mental health and it's like you don't beat fuck mental me health, yeah. you never beat mental health like I'm proud to say I don't take medication anymore but I'm also if you're on medication and it's working you stay on that like I for me my medication and stuff was just making me not feel like myself but it also played a massive part to sorting my life out enough to be able to do what I do now as yeah, well yeah so yeah yeah it's um again like what we were saying before it's like you've got to find what like works for you there is no like one-stop sort of shop when it comes to that stuff right yeah yeah there's not a one-stop shop that's for sure no and i mean for anyone anything diet wise like medicate like that nothing that works for you is gonna work exactly the same for me yeah and that's i'll say what what does work for me 
and that's my whole project 31 that's i don't want people to go chuck on their shoes and go run 31 marathons and you know life's gonna be fucking sweet hunky dory yeah but my thing about project 31 i wanted to show people what living in the the present moment can can do for you and uh, what it's done for me and my present moment was running so and how i did it ran 31 marathons to sort of create well and, and and my thing as well like i ran the same course every day for the mental side of things like a yeah, bit of a, a, yeah. a mental challenge yeah. but also i wanted to see that people go oh look at that rang He's a beard running the same spot same time every day and then look into why i was doing it like yeah yeah i wore this shirt that i'm wearing now and you know on the back of it it says exactly what i'm doing pretty much so um that was my thing as well as creating the awareness and doing the exact same thing so people would you know notice it and yeah so what was the exact route so you started the pirate ship at palm beach and then so what was your route and how did you kind of come up with that so i've started at palm beach ran up through burley through miami past Broadie, um surface and then hit about 800 meters past main beach sheridan um, lifeguard tower turned around there went back to uh, main beach pavilion had a bacon and egg roll and that was like my little where would you get the bacon egg roll they made it there at yeah. The pav. yeah at the pav there oh, so sick. i'd smack that back and that was like my little reward to to get me home and um i used to break it down so like i'd start off and go all right focus on the bacon egg roll yeah i'd run to my bacon egg roll smack that back and then it'd be like all right i'm hurting now focus on getting home and getting to treatment getting your float or getting to see kyle or re or or, or whoever it may be so then i'd run home and uh that was practically 31 days straight of doing the exact same thing and just simplifying things to the fact that i'd be able to you know mentally be able to process it all because mm. it's such a big task right like if you just looked at it as like one big thing you'd be like I, I fucking can't do this and the more people you speak to than do these big things say you never ever ever look further than one day ahead yeah like i had to really go one day one day and before i knew it i was already day 15 i'm like fuck all right one day one day one day before i know it, day 20 you know before i know it, 31 and then it's done and yeah. it's just like far out that went super quick did it blur together it did i yeah. was gonna say like, a lot of there's even been stuff where i've done like a 10 day motorbike ride and it's like day three four five and six or like fucking well they could have been the same day yeah and that's one thing that was big enough to like uh stand out that will stand out in my head like there was a a little boy ollie um mudgy and izzy's um grandson he would hold a sign like i remember things like that and and like fairly important things but yeah it did feel like you know a lot of the days did mold into you know one big one big super long day was there anything that stood out that really like was like the one big thing that just like blew you away day one i had uh a few people start around us and there was a guy that uh, opened up and said that i i potentially saved his marriage and saved his um life with my story and he found running and or see me what i was doing go running a crack and same thing grabbed by the balls and now he's <laughs> he's killing life he's so one of you crazy motherfuckers yeah <laughs> so runs and shit just things like that and yeah certain uh one big thing is just how much love and support i got from the community yeah. like people i didn't even know wasn't even running community as well there was on the especially the saturday which made me realize it was like i had the the running community with me from 4 a.m up until year nine o'clock but as soon as i hit that burley hill and looked up at it and it was just full of people that wasn't the running community the running community was behind me what was in front of me was a, a supporting mental health community and that was the whole of burley hill and that's what was this like right yet <laughs> yeah i know it touched people because all these people are here for a for to to watch me achieve my goal and b for mental health and for living yeah no nah, dude it's fun. yeah it's incredible was there a um did it make a stir in like the aussie running community like is it is there many people that do stuff like this in australia 
Um, last year, as I said, my mate Sean Bell ran 50 marathons in 50 days. That was for his mate. Um, he lost his mate and he, um, that was, I'm not too sure what he actually lost his mate for, but he did 50 marathons, 50, 50 days. And um, other than that, I haven't really seen too much, but then you got like over in the States, that's where all the bastards are crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like the Iron Cowboy. And uh, you got that dude then swam around England and- Dude, right? That guy was nuts. Yeah, and he's like just hands falling apart. And like there's, and that's the thing, like I know I can go further physically and mentally. Like this is like just a little, like a little scrape for me, a little, you know, little tickle yeah does it like so it obviously excites you pretty crazy at like what's possible now oh man this and that's the thing as well it's like opened up for even racing i know how to hurt i thought i suffered in races before i've never fucking suffered in my life in a race up until like the pains i went through in project 31 i know how i can i know i can go so much deeper than what i've ever been before like it's kind of opened up a whole new world a whole new realm in my head like in a race i would uh normally tone it back a little bit when i feel like so it's like i know that like i know that it can go a lot further and a lot deeper you got a green light now to just go beast mode yeah yeah i always think about stuff as like if you're in a room and then you've got a torch like just like say your iphone light and then it's like you like fuck where's the walls and you sort of walk around you got to get your phone to like fucking an inch away and be like yep that's a wall there and then you're like looking around i think that it's like any crazy big challenge or any new thing that you do it's like stepping into a massive dark room with just an iphone light and then it's like the longer you do it your eyes get more adjusted to it and then like you might get a better light a better torch and then all of a sudden you've been in this room for so long that you find the light switch that just lights up the whole room and i I think that that's probably like a good analogy for what you experience it's like you thought you'd seen all the shit in the room you thought you'd like lit it up to where you could see all of it but it's like it takes pushing further and further to now it's like you get that light switch moment where it's like you can see all the shit but then you'll probably you know your next challenge will probably make you find even another level again and it's like this is constant you're just constantly leveling up right yeah constant chasing the uh my dream which is to better myself as a, a human being and to better myself as a runner so um how do you think like this is going to change your life well i know for a uh a career perspective i I know what I want to do now career wise and as the f- when did you have that realization was it like halfway through or when it was done or no it was at the start like when I first started putting it putting myself out there with mental health and actually having so many people open up and uh, tell me you know their their dealings with mental health and uh, saying that what I've done opening up has done this for them and that rewarding feeling that I've had doing that has never like i've had a decent paying job for quite a while and yeah you get a paycheck yeah it buys your groceries and does things but the feeling you get from people saying you've helped them is far greater than any paycheck i've ever received in my life and like i've already said to live in uh i want to well, i'm going to start doing um going around with the uh, living well just to have a look and see how they do their programs and uh, eventually that's something i want to you know go and do so go stand up in front of a school and yeah. and 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 teach kids how to deal with adversity later on in life so you know if something ever happens they don't reach out to to drugs or they know how to deal with their mate who comes to them with a first-hand issue you know which is listening which is a big thing and not trying to problem solve and just really hopefully inspire you know kids to you know be the best version of themselves definitely dude well you're an inspiring guy uh won't won't take up too much uh, more of your time but i really appreciate you coming in man i'm really glad um i'm really glad we got to do this before uh i went away because i wanted to do it like fresh right after um and yeah it's a huge accomplishment can people still donate to your is that still open or yeah it's open to the end of uh this month september so where do people go if they want to donate towards your cause uh my i've got a link in my bio in my instagram bio or you can jump on everyday hero and it's 31 marathons 31 days and jake melby and then so your instagram handle is at forest goat right yeah forest.goat yes forest.goat. where'd that come from 
Well, uh, my brother actually has a, a trail running company, a clothing company called um, Run Goat Run, as well as he used to coach a fair few people and we're called the goats and uh he was run goat chief run goat and uh we all had our own little goat name and mine was forest goat for the love of the uh the forest that's crazy dude <laughs> I, I was like i wonder if it's going to do with forest gump where he just grew that crazy beard and just started fucking running <laughs> yeah no nah, it's uh not as cool as that <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i really appreciate you coming on man thanks very much for um sharing your story and and going into the like the dark parts of the story which i'm sure isn't always fun to keep reliving those memories and and those places but um i think it gives definitely gave me a a great perspective on um where you've come from to get to where you are now um and i i know that even though it's something that you do all the time and tell your story it still takes courage every time i'm sure yeah and it's getting much easier because now i've started the conversation it uh it, it all just flows that it's almost like a flow state now even just saying my, uh, you know tell my story so thanks for having me on brother no i really appreciate it dude and um and yeah we'll do it again after your next uh crazy shit that you decide to do next year then <laughs> sounds good all right thanks very much mate thanks brother you thanks Eve.